Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, hello to the online audience there as well. Uh, my name is Mike Collier, um, flight dispatcher, instructor at American Airlines. Uh, this is Matt. I'll, uh, we'll do our formal introductions here in a second. But uh, we're here today to uh, talk about flight dispatch, which is kind of the, as mentioned here, the other half of your flight, right? So it's kind of really what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, that you may not be aware of, right? So uh, airline pilots don't do their own flight planning. So it's uh, handled by a whole different group of uh, folks all together. So we're going to uh, walk you through, you know, a lot of the ins and outs of uh, what all goes into uh, an airline flight plan. Okay. So I'll let, uh, turn this over to Matt and then introduce himself and then back to me. Morning, everybody. My name is Matt Bartles. I'm a uh, <clears throat> new hire flight dispatch instructor for United Airlines. So United's going through unprecedented hiring in the flight dispatch department. So I'm helping train all those people to be line dispatchers for the airline. Uh, my <clears throat> background started at uh, Compass Airlines after I got my certificate in 2008. Worked at the regionals for about five years, moved my way up, uh, was a supervisor, a operations manager. And then the kind of career progression, you take the next step up, you go to a major airline. The airline that called first was Delta. So I went to Delta for about six years and got to experience all kinds of aircraft, dispatch, pretty much anything that was flying. And I also got to work the international operation, all uh, theaters in the world. <clears throat> Always wanted to uh, go to United. So in uh, 2020, at the best possible time, I uh, made the jump, went to United <laughs> Airlines and... Uh, it was a little rough going through uh, that first year, but uh, now I'm all signed off and teaching the new dispatcher, so it was a good career move. <clears throat> you can see the aircraft I've dispatched on the slide. Pretty much anything that's flying today, or has been flying in the past five years, I've pretty much touched. So, Go on to Mike's bio. Back to me. So the uh, so similar you know, career path, right? So uh, I uh, obtained my certificate back in 96. So I uh, started in the airline industry. Uh, with Mesa Airlines. Uh, that was back in Farmington, New Mexico, uh, when they were still there at, the, at that point, uh, working, you know, Beach 1900s and Dash 8s. And uh, this, this was really before the jet, the jet era of uh, regional aviation, right? So we didn't get our first uh, CRJ 200 series until I was there for almost a couple of years or so. So uh, from there, I went to America West in Phoenix, Arizona. I spent about 10 years out in the desert. Uh, out there with America West, and then from there, I just kind of got caught up in the whole, uh, you know, airline merger and move process, right? So we merged with uh, U.S. Airways, uh, went to Pittsburgh in uh, 2008, even though we actually officially merged in 05, spent some time there. That's when I moved uh, off of uh, just being a regular, like a line dispatcher into the training department. So uh, started in the training department there. Uh, merged with uh, American uh, almost 10 years ago at this point and uh, still in the training department as, uh, as an instructor and uh, we I, I do still work the desk uh, occasionally it's just not my regular day-to-day -day, you know gig at this point point. and so uh, so also do some new hire training and recurrent training and international initial and recurrent training uh, all of that for our dispatchers so uh, also have uh, an FAA uh, ATS uh, designation, so it's air transportation supervisor, or kind of a fancy name for just like a dispatcher check airman, right? So I'm qualified to give you know competency checks to uh, other dispatchers. So uh, that's something we have to do as well, all right? So just like pilots, we have to go through recurrent training, uh, you know, annual check rides, you know, to make sure that we're still competent to to, to do our jobs, right? So that's uh, that's all part of it, and so. Uh, let's see. Moving on, I'll give you back to Matt here for a minute. What's the magic button, anyways? Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, question to the audience. How many people do you think it takes to get an airplane from here at the gate to here landing on the runway? Everything. How, how many people do you think it takes to move this piece of equipment? Hundreds. Hundreds. So... We kind of start with the plan of the flight, right? So you come to the airport, you check in, you, you know, meet the customer service agents, you know, step one there. You have the ramp service agents, they're loading your bags, they're pushing the airplane back. You have, uh, come on, air traffic controllers keeping the airplanes apart and uh, safe en route. Come on. 
We have the aircraft maintenance technicians who are working on the aircraft, make sure they stay airworthy and safe. We've got the flight attendants who are there to ensure your safety, help with evacuation should it need, and then ancillary job, they, they'll bring you a Coke if you ask. Uh, you got the operations managers, so we'll talk about them in a little bit, but they're tasked with keeping the airline running operationally. Meteorologists who are looking out, uh, doing forecasts, finding out any weather threats out there. Operational support staff, there's just an army of operational support staff, crew schedulers, crew uh, routers, uh, planners, uh, other maintenance technicians. You name it, we have a advocate for them in our office. And then we have corporate staff. The airlines are a business after all, so we need to have you know, all the executive management, the finance people, the network planners, all that stuff. There's two people I haven't mentioned yet. You got the pilots who are kind of important, and then the most important group is the dispatchers. <laughs> uh, the reason they're there in the middle is, uh, as we're gonna see, they are integral to making sure these flights move. They're the only two people in the airline that can decide if a flight's gonna operate or not. All right, so when we're flight simulating, we actually are doing all these tasks. So we start off with, you know, GSX. You, how many use GSX? All right, you're doing customer service and ramp agents, right? There are some flight attendant functions in it, depending on what you're using. Um, something like PACX would have some of that functionality in it as well. If you get up to get a drink or a snack, you're performing one of the ancillary flight attendant duties. But again, their primary duties are safety, not uh, serving you. If you vector yourself for an approach, you're doing air traffic control functions. If you're trying to guess at what the weather's going to do, you're doing just as good a job as the real world meteorologists. <laughs> uh, if you're using like the maintenance functions to change the oil or whatever in your CDU on you know, the PMDG planes, that's maintenance functions. If you're planning the flight, deciding how much fuel you're gonna get, that's the dispatch function. And then obviously if you're flying, you're gonna be the pilot, right? So let's talk about the dispatchers and the operations managers for a second. The dispatchers, are um, tasked with the safety of flight and the operational control. We're gonna get back to that in a second. They focus on individual flights. So we have anywhere from 25 to 40 flights assigned to us that we individually work up a release and a plan for. We determine the route it's going to take and the fuel load, how much gas it's gonna get. Any maintenance functions you're gonna do to it, if they're gonna add some sort of a deferral, that goes through us, we have to approve that. We delay and cancel flights for safety reasons. You'll see in a minute there's another reason to delay and cancel flights that we don't do. So dispatchers are just safety related. We monitor and communicate with all the individual flights and routes. So we have those 30 flights, right? We're talking to them constantly, passing on information, making sure they stay safe. And we share legal responsibility with the captain. So back to the other slide, we have the two pictures up there. It's a 50-50 decision. We'll see that here in a minute. But uh, just the captain and myself, can authorize that flight to depart. Uh, you move on to an operation manager. So operations managers, they're tasked with a fleet. They keep the airline running. So they might have all the 737s or all the Airbuses. When things happen, they're there to coordinate swaps, coordinate crew swaps, anything it takes to keep the airline running. If we need to cancel a flight, they're tasked with making the decision to cancel. We will tell a operations manager that we're not gonna operate this flight from a dispatch perspective, that it be the operations manager that makes the final call and if it's going to formally cancel. But the refusal to dispatch is about the same as a cancellation anyways. Okay, so operations managers and dispatchers, we both make operational type decisions, but it's the scope of the issue that determines what um, category that falls into. So for example, if we have weather heading at a station, you know, line of thunderstorms, and a flight is told, to expect holding, and they're gonna get holding for you know, an hour till the weather clears. Captain's gonna to talk to somebody, and we're gonna decide if we're gonna to divert to our alternate. Who do you think makes that decision? The dispatcher. So that's a dispatch decision, individual flight, safety of flight issue. Another example, we've got a hurricane coming into South Florida. Meteorology says it's gonna be safe to operate until about eight hours prior to landfall. If we continue to fly, we're gonna be the heroes in the news, we're gonna get people out of there, but if we fly too long, we could be in a world of hurt. So we have to decide when we're gonna stop operations. Who do you think makes that call? That's the operations manager that would make that call. So they're making the big plans, how we're gonna run the airline, right? All right, so again, individual tactical decisions, those are dispatch. 
things that would affect the entire airline's operation, that's operations managers. And that's designed by the FAA because, as I said, there are only two people who are allowed to make decisions on the operation of flight. That's the pilot in command, who's the captain, and the aircraft dispatcher. So this uh, is called operational control. It is the foundation of our pilot dispatch system. It's one of the reasons we're so safe, because we have a 50-50 decision on whether or not we operate. And by a 50-50 decision, what that means is a flight may not depart unless the captain and the dispatcher feel it can be completed safely. It may not continue to fly at any point if the captain or the dispatcher think that it not, it's unsafe to continue. So 50-50 street has to be green-green to keep going. If that goes red at any point, flight can't continue. We have to divert somewhere. So to accomplish this, the aircraft dispatchers, they have the same aeronautical and systems knowledge of the aircraft as the captain. In fact, we might have a little bit more because we're responsible for all the fleets where the captain is only responsible for their own aircraft type. So we know all the aircraft types. All right, so there are about six primary responsibilities that dispatchers have in regulation from the FAA. For our flight simulation purposes, we're going to talk about the primary two that we do. That's the pre-flight planning and the flight following and the flight monitoring. So we're going to start with the pre-flight planning because every good flight starts with a good plan. All right, so what do we consider when we're planning flights? Safety is number one, paramount. Everything else doesn't matter if a flight's not safe. And then we're going to ensure safety. We're going to look at weather at all the airports en route, departure, destination, alternates. We're going to look at any en route hazards out there, weather, volcanic ash, turbulence, uh, you name it. The aircraft performance is the aircraft at a weight where it can take off and fly safely, especially if something happens, like losing an engine at takeoff. Are we still at a weight where we can climb out and be safe? If we have items broken or missing on the aircraft, any air traffic delays, airfield conditions, so on and so forth. And then in order, right at the bottom, economy. Uh, least amount of fuel and least amount of time en route. As long as I can satisfy all that above, then yeah, I'm going to try to save the company money and help make us make a profit. So goal, origin to destination, using the least amount of fuel and time possible while we ensure safety and operational liability of flight. And kind of, as I mentioned, that means sometimes we're going to take a longer route, we're going to spend more money in gas, just to make sure that we have a safe flight and it's going to be comfortable for our passengers and our crew members. All right, so we're going to plan a flight from LA to JFK using Simbrief today. All right, so Simbrief, great desktop application on the web. They also have an app that's really cool. Uh, Mike was just showing it to me today. I've never seen the app before. It does everything the website can do, and it's very convenient on the iPad. All right, it also will create a dispatch release that looks very similar to what the actual pilots are going to get, the product that we dispatchers put out. It has advanced route finding capabilities. It can do CFMU validation for those of you that fly in Europe and uh, Euro control. The fuel planning and the burns is pretty realistic, and you also can do some ETOP stuff, so Simbrief is really good to move on. So we have some steps we're going to follow. First thing we're going to do is we're going to check the MEL and CDL status. We'll talk about that more in a second. We're going to review our weather. We're going to choose an alternate if we need it. Uh, we're going to review the in-route weather and plan route, so anything in-route from A to B, and decide how we're going to get to A to B. We're going to decide how much fuel goes on the aircraft. Finally, we're going to release the flight file, the flight plan, so you guys are ready to hop in your sims and fly that airplane. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mike. He's going to talk to you a little bit about maintenance. Our favorite topic, maintenance. Uh, it's uh, one of the, the banes of our existence, broken airplanes. Right? But uh, so yeah, kind of as Matt mentioned, step one, right? So one of the first things we look at uh, as we start this whole flight planning process, kind of what's, what's the condition of our airplane? What's the status of our airplane? So it, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to kind of start the whole planning process if you have a broken airplane, All right? So uh, it's, you know, it's not uncommon to have components that are, uh, are, are either missing completely or broken on an airplane and still have it, you know, uh, still have it be legal to operate the aircraft, to still be able to fly. All right, um, so in this case, for our example today, we were using a 777-200, it has MEL 352103. Uh, applied against the airframe. So, anybody know what an MEL is? Yeah, 
Yeah, so the um, so there is there is the, a master uh, in the uh, who, any dispatchers in here by the way. It's just uh, okay. Who, who, who are you dispatching for? Who, who do you dispatch for? Retired dispatcher from Endeavor. Oh, retired from Endeavor. Okay. Yeah. Nice, yep. nice, nice. Well, welcome. So yeah, so uh, MEO minimum equipment list, as uh, as mentioned. So the uh, so the uh, there there is a master. Uh, minimum equipment lists that are published, and then uh, you know each of the airlines will kind of tailor that a little bit, you know. But uh, still, it uh, complies with the uh, uh, with with the master MEL, right? So uh, minimum equipment list. So some, th something on the airplane is broken, right? It could be it could be something as simple as a you know maybe a tray table or an armrest, you know, something. You know, or it could be something a little more critical, you know, maybe you know, an air conditioning pack, yeah, you know, something with the oxygen system, you know, maybe a, an instrument. Uh, in the flight deck, you know, ILS receiver or something in there that could be uh, um, inoperative. Uh, and depending on what the M uh, MEL is, there could be uh, penalties and restrictions that go along with that. So that's something we have to consider on our planning process. You know, if uh, depending on what's broken, can we comply with that uh, restriction or limitation? Uh, along with that minimum equ uh, equipment list, we have something called a CDL, which is a configuration uh, deviation list. Uh, similar, it's just a list of authorized items that can be completely missing, physically missing off of the airplane. So that could be something like uh, like a little wastewater access doors, for example. You know, because they're the little little panels you see on the side of the fuselage and things. So maybe maybe one blew off or something. You know, just so it's it's physically gone. All right. So uh, oftentimes CDLs come with uh, performance penalties as well. Right. So if you have a little access door that's completely missing off the aircraft, it's going to create a little drag. You know, so that may, uh, because of the additional drag, uh, may require a little uh, additional fuel. Right? So things like that we have to consider in the, uh, in the planning process. Um, so yeah, so uh, based on the uh, MELs and CDLs, we can uh, most times legally dispatch uh, the airplane uh, in that condition. So here's something you can apply to your uh, simming at home, right? Try adding an MEL CDL item to your airplane. See if you can comply with that restriction. Right. Um, the, these are available online. Uh, there is a really long URL to get to this, but if you simply Google Master MEL, uh, you'll, you'll find the link that will uh, take you to the uh, Master MEL list. And you can find these for just about every airframe type that's out there. All right, so you should be able to easily find uh, whichever favorite aircraft that you like to operate and then uh, go from there. All right. Um, so in this case, our, back to our 3521-03, and if you kind of look in uh, on the right-hand column there under uh, remarks and exceptions, it says uh, maybe inoperative provided the manual deployment system operates normally. So this is the automatic presentation system for the passenger oxygen. So if the manual system operates normally, uh, and the other restriction is the flight must remain at or below flight level 300. Okay. Uh, if we think we can accept that restriction, we move on. Okay, so step two, uh, this kind of gets into the weather portion of it, right? We, we need to review departure uh, and arrival weather. So we occasionally we're, we're, we're uh, throwing up some uh, you know the regulatory you know the regs that uh, go along with that so you know part 121 regulations so we have to be uh, thoroughly familiar with all of the weather conditions on the, you know along the route to be flown uh, and it says we cannot release uh, an aircraft for operations unless uh, the weather and the forecasts or combinations thereof that, that will be at uh, or above minimums at our uh, time of arrival. So if we're going to dispatch to an airport, we need to make sure that they're forecasting um, to be at or above landing minimums by the time we get there. Right? It makes sense, right? We don't want to go, you know, fly all the way to where we're going and then, you know, we can't land, right? So we need to make sure we have weather minimums. Uh, minimums, the published minimums can be found on approach charts. Uh, everybody in here on Navigraph you know, charts, and uh, yeah, just about everybody. It's kind of become the gold standard in the industry now for simulation, right? So I think uh, pretty much uh, all you Navigraph users out there. So when you look at your, um, uh, your approach charts and your MINs, uh, they're going to be toward the bottom. So these are the uh, Jeppesen format uh, on your minimums down there. So the, um, at the top, depending on how you configure your uh, chart display, uh, you can put it into a format where you have the, you know, that little 
A, stylized A symbol at the top of the chart. So that indicates that it is uh, an, an air carrier uh, chart format on there. Um, so the difference between the air carrier chart format and kind of your standard format is um, the minima box at the bottom, it only contains your approach category C and your approach category D minima, right? It strips out your cat A, cat B. So that's why you only see that and uh, you have consolidated uh, minimums. So you don't have a, a separate approach plate for cat two, a separate plate for cat three. So they consolidate cat one, cat two, cat three, approach minima uh, all together there at the bottom. Um, so approach categories for commonly used aircraft in the, in the sim. So approach category C is going to be uh, most of your Airbuses, so your 319, 20, 717s, uh, your 73, 700s, 75s, uh, 200, 777, 200. So what might surprise you, approach category D, A321, 737, 800, and the 900. Um, seven six, seven eight. Your, your wide body airplanes for for the most part, and then uh, if anybody still flies the uh, MD eighties, uh, they're at the bottom. So those are kind of some of the uh, common aircraft that fall into those different uh, uh, approach categories, and that's uh, that's based on approach speed, right? So depending on uh, the approach speed of the airplane is uh, what category it falls into. So. Uh, so continuing on step two. So we are trying to uh, dispatch our flight to uh, New York today. So here's our forecast, our TAF, our terminal forecast. Uh, so we are uh, estimating arriving in New York at about 2015 Zulu uh, in there. So uh, reading the TAF, here it says from uh, 1900 Zulu, we have winds uh, 310 at 14, uh, better than six miles visibility, uh, 1500 broken, 3500 broken. Uh, can we dispatch our flight arriving at 2015? Okay, so and as we mentioned before, so the the regulation says we have to be at or above minimums at the time of arrival. So, uh, just a lot of approaches in New York. Just you know, this one here, just to uh, three one right, for example, shows uh, two hundred and one half. So we're forecasting better than two hundred and one half, right? So it's, so we are we are good to continue so far. So cat one minimums to kind of your classic cat one two hundred and a half. So. Continuing on, so uh, the, if the pilot in command, another regulatory item here, if, if the pilot in command has not served 100 hours in that type of airplane, we have to increase the minimums by 100 feet and uh, one half mile. Okay, so we, different airlines may call this different things. American calls it a, re, uh, a restricted captain. I don't know, United, what are they? You, high minimums. Just high minimums. Yeah, yeah kind of you know, most of my career, we always just call it you know, high men, you know, high men captain, you know, high minimums captain. Uh, American Airlines uh, elects to call it a restricted captain uh, on that. Same, same uh, implication there. So, another tip. So, anytime you buy a new add-on aircraft, you want to jump in and go drive off on it, you know. So uh, don't, don't forget, until you put 100 hours in on that new, brand new add-on you have, you're a high minimum captain. You've got to increase your minimums. After 100 hours, now you can go down to the published minimums. All right? Here's another challenge for you. Okay, step three, uh, selecting an alternate. Um, not every flight must carry an alternate. There's uh, many times, you know, weather permitting, we can plan a flight without an alternate. And really, uh, ideally, that's what we try to do, right, because it's less fuel. Um, so another regulatory item here. So we cannot dispatch a uh, flight unless uh, we list at least one alternate for the, uh, de each destination in the release. So uh, kind of the middle part of that. So no alternate airport is required for at least one hour before, one hour after the ETA. Uh, if the weather uh, forecast indicates that the ceiling will be at least 2,000 feet above the airport elevation, or the visibility will be at least three miles. So there's a little memory trick for that, you know. So for those of you that have kind of worked in the industry and uh, dealt with this before, kind of the memory trick is the one, two, three rule. All right, so you're looking at plus or minus an hour. So uh, there's, there's your one hour plus or minus ceiling 2,000 feet, visibility three miles. That's your one, two, three rule. Uh, that's, that is when an alternate would be required to be planned. Okay. 
uh, do we need an alternate? So if we are arriving, again, our ETA is at 2015 Zulu. There's our forecast from 1900 Zulu. Are we legally required to plan an alternate airport based on our one, two, three rule? Hour before, remember, you have to look at hour before, hour after, 2003. Yes. So in this case, yes. Right? So yes, we do. Uh, need an alternate in this uh, in this scenario because uh, you know based on that forecast line, you get the one two three rules. So we we got that we got that broken layer in there at fifteen hundred. Okay, so that's less than two thousand feet. Visibility's good. The ceiling's the problem, right? Um, ceiling is defined as the lowest layer that is uh, reported as broken or overcast. Okay, scattered is not a ceiling. Broken or overcast would be con it would constitute a ceiling, so in this case, yeah, we would need uh, we would need that alternate. Okay, so again, uh, uh, with alternates, the, the the planning goal from a planning standpoint, we want to try to plan the closest alternate we possibly can, just to save the gas. Right, so if we're going to New York, we don't want to carry, you know, Chicago as an alternate. You know, that just would not make sense in most cases. Uh, so. You, know, you want to try to find the closest, you know, next door type of alternate uh, that you possibly can that uh, that meets alternate weather minimum requirements. So uh, alternate airports also have to meet certain criteria. Right? So again, back to the regulations, uh, we cannot list an airport as an alternate uh, unless the uh, the weather indicates uh, it will be at or above alternate weather minimums at that time of arrival. All right. So here's how you can calculate or derive uh, your alternate minimums. So this kind of comes down to a couple of, uh, couple of options here. So we um, call it like the one nav rule or maybe the one runway rule, depending on how you want to look at it. So, but the, uh, uh, for airports with at least one operational navigation uh, facility providing a uh, instrument approach, like an ILS, VOR, uh, we come up with our alternate minimums by adding 400 feet to the ceiling and one mile to the, uh, to the visibility. So whatever's published, right, we're adding 401 to that. So for example, if we're coming into, we'll just pretend our alternate's just, uh, just a single runway airport here. So uh, on, on runway 28, we have an ILS that's published at 200 and a half. So we have our additive down here. So 401, add that together. Uh, so our alternate minimums for this particular airport become 601 and a half. Make sense? Okay. Uh, so that's just the, uh, the, the, the one uh, navigation rule. Uh, we have a two nav rule or a two runway rule. Okay, so same concept. So we have to have uh, at least two operating navigational facilities providing uh, an approach to different suitable runways. Okay, so it doesn't have to necessarily be a separate piece of concrete. It could be the reciprocal end of the same piece of concrete. Just, uh, just different uh, navigation facilities there. I mean, so you'd have an ILS to one end and an ILS to the other end. Uh, so in this case, uh, you're adding 200 feet to the ceiling and a half mile to the visibility, but it has to be added to the higher of the two. So you have to compare the, uh, the, the minimums. So this ILS is maybe 300 and a half. The other one might be 203 quarter. The ceiling is higher on one. The visibility is higher on the other. So you have to take whatever's more restrictive between the two and then apply your additive to that. Okay. Yes. So can you use, assuming that the, the, it's a headwind for one side and then the other side is just a tailwind? Yeah, <laughs> and, that's, uh, and that is a consideration, right? So, the, uh, so uh, this is where, you know, no TAMs, winds, uh, things come into, into play, All right? So as, uh, as mentioned here, it was uh, right. Isaac, his, uh, Isaac just uh, uh, astutely mentioned here, right? Headwinds and tailwinds, do we have to consider that? Absolutely. All right, so it, uh, it, it needs to be usable, right? So we might have a, you know, a, you know, a 20 knot headwind landing on 2.8, but you flip around, that's gonna now be a 20 knot tailwind, which is likely gonna exceed your aircraft limitations, All right? So that is not going to be usable due to the winds, you know, like runway conditions, and, and uh, you know, you know, MELs can come into that, NOTAMs. Yes, sir? Add to the question. Sure. Basically, 
Right. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, for those of you who maybe didn't hear, then so, yeah, so just your, your wind limitations come into play, right? Your head, headwind, tailwind, crosswind, uh, limitations on the aircraft. So you have to consider that just for suitability for that, uh, for those approaches and that, uh, and those runways then. So, uh, again, so you're taking the, whatever the higher of the two is, uh, and you, you apply your additives uh, to those. So in, in this example here, the, your alternate minimums become 501 and uh, one quarter. Okay, um, American, and I always forget. You guys have this too yeah, in, we in do. your op specs. So we it's uh, our aircraft. <clears throat> uh, so we we can uh, we can take credit for uh, Cat two and Cat three uh, in uh, in our planning. So if the airport has a usable Category two uh, approach, no additives are required at that point. It's just a uh, just a straight three hundred and three quarters for alternate minimums. Uh, if the airport has a usable Cat uh, Category three approach. Again, no additives are required. The minimums are 200 and one half. And, uh, and so th those, uh, that, uh, that is what has to be in the, in the forecast uh, for your ETA at that alternate uh, to make it a, a legal alternate airport. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you yeah. have to be at or above the authorized minimum. So if you have cat Category 3 available, then you would be at or above authorized minimums with Category 3. Cause... Yeah, so when you're not basic dispatch, simply off cat uh, Category 1. Yeah. Right, so whatever, you know, as, as Matt just mentioned, you know, so if there's Cat 2, Cat 3 available, you know, wh whatever the lowest, you know, uh, land minim minimums would be for that airport, uh, if we can meet that uh, at the uh, time of arrival, yes, we can still legally dispatch to uh, to that airport. Yes, sir. So everything. So all, so all of our flights coming to Dallas. Everybody goes to Austin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's a consideration, and ultimately yeah. the dispatcher and the captain have final say on where that airplane goes, and if there are 60 diversions in Austin and we have to go to Austin because that's the only place we can go, we'll be number 61. But yeah, yeah. so we do put consideration to that. We try to spread out the pain a little bit, so not one, every, not one alternate gets hit with all of them. So. And, and I assume there's also that you have actually staff in the airport versus like uh, an airport that you don't have a uh, flight ticket. Uh, right, yeah, we, I mean, we don't want to just drop into just any airport. I mean, you know, there's, uh, there's something that's, you know, we can, you know, uh, operation specifications. So we, we have a specific list of authorized airports where we can operate, that includes alternates, right? So we want to make sure that we're using those. Um, you know, other considerations as far as like diverting and, you know, like Matt said, kind of, kind of spread the love, spread the pain. There, you know, as far as you don't want to send everybody to one place. I mean, you know, just uh, kind of spread everybody out. That way they can kind of get in and out faster. Crew time becomes an issue. You know, pilots now, you know, they've got, you know, um, you know, they, you know, duty day, uh, you know, you know crew, crew time issues that we're looking at. Uh, also, if it's an uh, international operation, do they have customs at, at, at that airport? You know, you don't want to bring, a, you know, an international flight in that's been, that's been flying for 12 or 15 hours, divert to some uh, airport that, you know, where customs is not available. So there's a lot of considerations and we just don't just, you know, just randomly just drop into any airport you know there's a lot of thought that goes in and that's part of the pre-planning process too right you know during the kind of the during this phase of the uh, the planning the operation you know we take that into consideration where's the weather going to be 15 hours from now when we actually arrive is it, are, are there going to be thunderstorms where what direction are they coming from what direction are they going to be moving to um, you know what uh, you know the, the, as far as alternate selection yeah there's a lot a lot of thought that has to go into that you know if we divert What's the implications? So you had a question? Uh, yes, thank yeah. you. So, so this is all happening before the flight. Way before. Right, way, way before. In we're some talking cases. four hours to two hours prior to that yeah. flight pushing the gate that we're considering all this. How long does it take you guys to do that analysis? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just loaded. One minute. For, one, for one flight. Actually, one minute or 60 seconds. Is that you do a system? Yeah, and it's... Okay. Um, you know, d domestically, if, if the weather's good, you know, we, we, can, we can evaluate, you know, fairly quickly. But, you know, if, if the weather is not so good or, you know, and, you know, air traffic control comes into this a lot, too. That's, that's another component uh, that we have to consider. 
you know, um, it's, it, it could take, you know, just a matter of just a few minutes for a relatively simple, short, you know, domestic flight, or it could take several hours for, you know, a long-haul international flight, you know, so it, it varies, you know. I, I guess my real question is, you guys have, because uh, this is obviously an overwhelming amount of information, so you have, like, decision support software that kind of does a lot of this for you, and... Some, I mean, you know, yeah, we have tools that help us, you know, do the planning, and we have a lot of, you know, tools to look at. Uh, but you know, ultimately, really, you know, that, that's where the human element comes in, right? You know, it's uh, you know, still the decisions have to be, you know, made by human beings here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you have a uh, authorized list and alternate. Yeah. We know what airports we have that have support, but at the end of the day, every airline has their own individual lists of airports that they operate regular service to, uh, and then airports that they would have as an alternate. So, but it's different for every airline, so what American has is not the same as what United has. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So everybody, get it. Everybody that wanted a picture of this, get this uh, you know, your, for your kind of your table of as far as calculating alternate minimums. Before. I sure. So what 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 it's that when it's talking about two nav it's talking about two navigational facilities, not having two navigational equipments on the aircraft. So do we have two operational instrument approaches to that airport? If we do, then we can apply these lower additives as opposed to the higher additives. Okay. Yeah, like a, like a VOR or an ILS. Or so it's, it's not the airplane equipment. It's the ground based equipment. Because I mean, those airliners, they have everything under the sun on top of on them. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. This, so this is referring to the ground-based equipment, like your ILS, VORs, NDBs, all that kind of stuff. You know. And so you know, but they're, yeah, we get into like RNAV. That, yeah. uh, and, well, <laughs> that's, that's that's a whole other story here. So uh, yeah. So kind of as mentioned, we kind of started down this road a little earlier, right? So alternate selection considerations like weather. Uh, you know, ATC constraints, no TAMs, I mean, what runways are closed, what, you know, maybe uh, NAV facilities might be an operative, you know, maybe uh, ILS or et cetera, uh, MELs, uh, customs for international, things like that, right? So we're a, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot's going on there, right? So, um, so looking at possibly Newark, here's our forecast. We have uh, winds variable at uh, four, a uh, mile and a half, missed, 700 broken. Uh, would Newark be a legal alternate? Uh, for an approximate 2107 ETA if we divert to Newark. I'll help you guys out here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, it would be, right? So if, we, if we're looking at, so some Cat 2, Cat 3's note them out. So we'll, we'll just look at, so we kind of have basically our standard, uh, standard Cat 1 here, right? So uh, uh, four left and four right. We have, a, we have a Cat 1 approach to each of those runways. Uh, so in this case, we could apply our two navigation rule, uh, add 200 and a half to come up with 401. So basically, as long as the forecast uh, is better than 401 at our ETA, then that would you know, constitute a legal alternate, right? So yes, uh, Newark is a legal alternate. We'll go ahead and use that. Uh, and alternates are not just for destinations. Uh, we also need to consider the need for possibly a takeoff alternate. Okay, um, some more regulatory items over here. So basically, if the weather conditions at the airport of uh, departure are below landing minimums for that airport, we have to designate somewhere else to go, right? Just in the event at V1, you lose an engine. Are you going to be able to come back around and land at that same airport where you just departed from? In some cases, no, right? So you gotta, we, have, we have to consider you know, the possibility of having to go somewhere else. Right. So for uh, aircraft, aircraft having two, uh, two engines or more, it's uh, no, no more than one hour uh, from the departure airport, normal cruise speed. Three or more, uh, we can go out two, uh, two hours. So I think probably most of us are using just two engine airplanes in the sim for the most part. So you can go out to uh, a maximum of, uh, 
uh, one hour. So in this example here, LA, uh, if we have a quarter mile fog, and if we're looking at the approach back to runway 25 right, it's just down, you know, the minimum's there, kind of a standard cat one, 200 and a half. Well, if it's, you know, if we can only go down to a half a mile visibility on that approach, and it's a quarter mile, if we lose an engine at V1, we can't come back around and land, right? Where are we gonna go? That's where, that's kind of where this comes into play of uh, selecting a takeoff alternate. So do we need one? Yeah, we do, right? So here's some here's a little uh, quick table there on the one hour distances for uh, some of our commonly used airplanes, right? So it's, it's, it's anywhere from you know, three, 375, 350, 400 mile range uh, for the most part uh, between the uh, Airbus and the Boeings. Okay. All right, uh, sim brief, kind of back to that for a second. It, does, uh, it will allow you to plan a takeoff alternate and uh, you can dis uh, designate, specify a maximum distance in there that you want it to look, right? So in this example here, uh, for our 777, we can go out our one hour maximum distance is 375 nautical miles. We can designate, specify 375. Uh, you can click the find button down there and it will give you a list of potential options out to that maximum distance, okay? So rules for takeoff alternate minimums are the same as destination alternates. A takeoff alternate is still an alternate, so it still has to meet alternate weather minimum requirements like we uh, mentioned previously, okay? So we'll assume, uh, assuming Ontario is about 40, 41 miles away, uh, we'll just make the assumption that they are a legal alternate for us. All right, so yeah, there when you click the find button, it'll give you the list of the, in distance order, of your options. All right, so here's an example of a flight I planned. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll give this back to Matt and let him talk to you for a while. Don't worry, I'm getting rusty too, being in the schoolhouse. Uh, <laughs> we still have to maintain our qualification as uh, instructors. We still have to go and work the floor, but yeah, I, I'd say Mike kind of... Uh, didn't do it quite right on that one. Mm. All right, so when we're reviewing en route weather and we're planning our route, what are we looking at? Well, we have all kinds of tools to uh, this gentleman's point. Uh, we have tools that will show us text weather, the TAFs, the METARs, the upper air prognostic chart showing us where turbulence and possible convective activity would be, other convective outlooks, forecast radar products. We have all kinds of toys in our office. Our PIREPs are SIGMETs, ATC advisories, and much, much more. We can't go into all of them given the time we have. But uh, we have lots of toys. All right, again, what's our goal? Most economical route while considering the en route hazards and constraints. Normally, our primary consideration is going to be fuel burn for fuel time. We want that to be as low as possible while we still accomplish the mission. International operations, for those of you that fly internationally, overflight permits kind of come into this. So sometimes it might be more expensive to fly over Russia, perhaps, instead of flying over um, the U.S. And, and Japan when you're going to Tokyo. So that's, it might be less fuel burn to go over Russia, but it's cheaper to go further south. So that's kind of where that comes into play. However, ATC kind of handcuffs us to what we could do sometimes. Uh, they'll put out advisories and they'll say, nope, you will file on this route. We don't care. Uh, so they'll publish these advisories and say, this is what you have to do. So today, we have an ATC adv route advisor we have to consider. This is the JFK mid routes. So what the advisory is telling us to do, if you see the box there, it's giving us a route segment that we have to file. So from Panhandle, which is PNH, we have to follow that route all the way into JFK. ATC doesn't care how we get to Panhandle, we just have to get to Panhandle and then follow that. And if we don't do that, ATC is gonna say try again and reroute us onto that. So it behooves us to plan for those contingencies. SimBrief will let us do this, so we can input the required route portion in the SimBrief, and then we click on the Find Route button, and then it will optimize our route from LA to that panhandle fix, and then we'll have a complete route. So you see we did that, SimBrief spit this route at us, and I think it looks pretty good. We avoid thunderstorms, we comply with what ATC said us to, told us to do, and we limited our exposure to turbulence. So if we look at the weather that SimBrief put in, Pretty good job keeping us away from all these thunderstorms. And then if we look at the Navigraph turbulence overlay, at that 300 that our MEL did, it actually kept us below the worst of the turbulence. So it should be a nice smooth ride for our passengers. No uh, thunderstorms that deviate around, so on and so forth. Tim? Yes. 
Yes, you can get those off the Aviation Weather Center, the Center Weather Advisories. Uh, the Command Center ATC Advisories, I think that's what you're looking at. Yeah. That you can get from the FAA OIS page. Uh, mm -hmm. So just Google FAA OIS or current reroutes, and then that'll, or FAA current advisories, that'll pull it up. All right. Mike's going to talk to you quickly about uh, performance. So performance, yeah. So along with kind of you know, planning the route, you know, and you know, make sure we are complying with you know, weather and thunderstorms and you know the the ATC route advisories, and, and that's a big deal this time of year. Uh, you know, with the, uh, the when thunderstorm season, you know, with all the uh, ATC route advisories we have to comply with there. So along with that, then we also have to consider the uh, takeoff and landing performance. Um, that that's always been a challenge for us is, uh, you know, to to apply in the simulator. Right, just to be able to calculate that. Um, the, anybody a Topcat user? Have you used Topcat in the past, or maybe still using it there? But it's uh, it's at this point getting to be a, a bit of an older application, but it it's, still works. Uh, but it will calculate takeoff and uh, landing uh, performance. Uh, so just from a, like a regulatory standpoint, so these are everything that we have to consider that could potentially limit a takeoff weight just from a performance standpoint, right? So we're looking at certainly the, 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 the manufacturer's structural uh, takeoff and landing weights, uh, but some other, you know, just other performance-related items that we have to consider, it would be the, uh, the, the climb performance, obstacle performance, tire speed, uh, minimum control ground speed, uh, the field length, brake energy, uh, we have to consider if the runway is wet or contaminated, uh, we're talking contamination, we're talking like ice and snow, right? Not just rain and you know, water, right? So, uh, and of course, MEL considerations. So the, uh, some MELs are performance limiting, right? So uh, we, we have to, uh, to consider that. Um, just kind of, that's kind of a quick snapshot out of the, uh, the top cap uh, application on how it, uh, how it does its calculations, right? So that's the output from that. Uh, some things that may limit landing weight of course, the, the, uh, the manufacturer's uh, structural, kind of the published uh, structural weight, so we certainly have to comply with that. Uh, an approach climb limit, landing climb limit, so that's if, you know, with one engine in op or all engines uh, operating, so approach and landing climb limits. Again, the, the length of the runway that we're dealing with, a field length limit. Uh, also, again, wet or contaminated, uh, and uh, also MEO considerations. So uh, all things we have to think about when calculating the numbers and the weights for um, takeoff and landing. Okay, uh, kind of step number five here is uh, fuel. You, I can do it. You, use that me. All right. All right, so uh, the minimum requirements for fuel on a flight are uh, determined by the regulations. Uh, Dispatchers and captains have the override ability to put more aircraft uh, fuel on there for uh, operational considerations, make sure we complete the flight safely, uh, make sure we get to where we want to go. But the minimum requirements, we have to fly to the airport to which we're dispatched, fly A to B, there's no point if we don't have enough fuel to get from A to B, right? Uh, we then have to land, have enough fuel to get to and land at our most distant alternate. Again, pretty common sense. If we list an alternate, we need to be able to get there. And then because the FAA does not trust us, we have to have 45 minutes at normal speed cruise on every flight, no matter what. That's what we call our FAR reserve. Uh, so if anything happens, we still have a little bit of gas left over to uh, go somewhere. What are we uh, thinking about when we compute fuel? All the below. Any wind, any traffic delays, doing an approach, maybe a missed approach at an airport, and literally anything else that we think could delay the landing of the aircraft, we can put on fuel for, and we are required to put on fuel for by the regulations. All right, so the FAA required fuels, I remember this is bar fuel, burn off alternate reserve. Very easy to remember because that's how much the crew needs to get to the hotel bar. <laughs> All right. Are the minimum requirements enough? No, I just kind of said they're not. We add extra fuel to protect operational integrity of the flight and prevent against any in-flight contingencies. That amounts at our discretion, and then the captains can also add fuel over that if they feel that it's warranted. So why would we add extra fuel? We have thunderstorms in route. We're going to have to deviate around them. Uh, we have ATC volume going into the New York metros. That's always going to be an issue. Any weather impact. So, you know, we're coming into Houston in the middle of the afternoon with thunderstorms. 
and one decides to drift over the field, we're going to have to hold out for it and have gas for it. Uh, any reroutes you might see, any turbulence, any de-icing, pretty much anything we think of that could cause us a problem we're going to add fuel for. So what's our release fuel? That's the bare fuel. It's your bar fuel plus your extra. So burn off alternate reserve extra. All right. So for today's example, we're going to JFK, very busy airport, New York Metro is very congested airspace. I'm going to add 50 minutes of fuel. Why? We have ceilings in JFK, which could slow us down. Our alternate's really close because it's Newark, so it's not like we have a lot of gas to go to a further alternate, so I want to protect for that. Diversion's unlikely, but if we get a hold, JFK might not be able to handle the planned traffic. We want to have extra gas for that. If you're flying on VATSIM and you're flying into an event, plan plenty of extra fuel. They get very, very busy and you will see a hold. All right. Very easy to add fuel in SimBrief. So you come down to the optional entries and over where it says extra fuel, you're going to change that number to how many pounds or minutes you want. I suggest using minutes. Um, pounds mean nothing to me. Minutes do. So you have to click it in the drop down. Come on. All right, step six, we actually release the flight. On SimBrief, you would hit generate flight plan, and then that's what does this part. And then we can do a final review before we release. So are we at flight level 300 because of the MEL? We look over our release document, 290, check. Are we on the ATC required alternate, and then we, then we list the takeoff alternate? You will see the takeoff alternate on some of the SimBrief outputs. The uh, American one that they have does not show it. But if we look at the ATC strip down there, you see T, Alt, Ontario. So yeah, it's on there. Did we comply with the required route? If we go back to the advisory and we compare at Panhandle, are we on that? Yes, we are. Did we review all the weather and determine needs for alternates? Yes, we did. We have our Newark alternate up there, right? So there it is. And then does the fuel meet the FAR minimum requirements and then dispatch it added extra? Sure does. There's your alternate. There's your burn off up top. There's your reserve, 89.45. You see the extra, 12.530 for the 50 minutes. And then our gate release fuel, how much we're actually putting on the aircraft at the gate, is 110.5 about. All right. Release one is generated. We file with ATC. SimBrief has a great functionality where you can literally click pre-file for all the major networks. It takes you to their web page. You hit submit, and it's on file for uh, flying on your online networks. All right. We've just done 10% of the work. <laughs> the safest flights are the flights that are on the ground. Where we earn our money and our primary function as flight dispatchers in the safety realm is flight monitoring. All right. So our challenge is to keep them safe in the air by making these stressful situations while they're en route. As I said, we're always in contact with these flights. Anything goes wrong, they're coordinating with us. Again, we share the joint responsibility with them. Anything happens, the captain dies and I go to jail. I don't want that to happen. All right. So we're always looking out for hazards. We see thunderstorms developing. We see any NOTAM changes, any political actions on the international flights, destination issues. JFK went into holding, for instance. Our alternate weather changed en route. Now it's illegal. We have to go to a different alternate because we cannot continue on with an illegal alternate. Something broke in flight. You know, we are always looking out for them and helping them out with this stuff. All right, so as anticipated, we got a hold going into JFK. They're holding that Geno. Their expect further clearance time is 30 minutes, and they have 23.9 fuel on board. All right, what do we do? Well, we go back to our bar fuel. What's our minimum fuel we have to have on that aircraft at any given point? It still applies, our burn-off alternate reserve. Since we've gone a long ways, we've burned most of that burn-off, right? So if we go to our release document, we see we have 1,400 pounds left in our burn-off to get from Geno to JFK. So we have to have that on board. We have to have our alternate fuel on board. That's not going to change because we haven't burned it yet, right? And then we have our reserve fuel, which we can't touch. That has, has to be on there. All right. So fuel on board at Geno is 23,900. The required fuel is 15,084. So how much fuel do we have left for holding? 8,816 pounds. That's about 43 minutes of gas. 
So can we take this hold? Can we hold for 30 minutes? Easily. So no problem. Where do we really make our money? Keeping the flight safe. So while we have all this going on in JFK, while we're planning our next four flights, we get a call from our 737 going down to Key West. Hey, dispatch, we just lost hydraulic system B. All right, well, what's that mean to me? I have access to all these manuals. I know how these systems work. We lost some flight spoilers. We're in a slow extension on our flaps, and we can only go to flaps 15. We're in the alternate braking mode. We're going to have thrust asymmetry. Our runway at Key West is just over 5,000 feet long. And now we have significant maintenance that we need on the aircraft, but we're not in a situation where we need to land at the nearest suitable airport. We can have some options and come up with a good game plan. So do you think this is safe to continue? Should we continue on to Key West? I'm seeing a thumbs down. I'm seeing thumbs, oh, thumbs, down. thumbs down. Thumbs down, thumbs down, thumbs down. Thumbs down, thumbs down. I would potentially agree, yes. So the captain en route has the ultimate authority on the aircraft, right? That does not alleviate the dispatcher of making sure that he doesn't make a mistake. We still have to verify everything and give them our utmost support. So they're thinking it's okay to go to Key West. I'm looking at the numbers and I say, it's not safe to continue to Key West. I would advise we go somewhere else. And if I don't say that, then I'm just as much at fault as the captain is if something happens. All right, so yeah, the prudent course of action here would be to agree on a plan for landing somewhere else than Key West. I'm seeing an airport up here that might be an even better option. All right, yeah, Captain, I suggest we go to Miami because they're going to have longer runways. They're going to have better, better crash fire rescue if we need it. And uh, it's a big American maintenance base, so we might be able to get in there and get some help. So our job, primarily about safety. Let's see, I'll give you one second. So it's uh, checks and balances. We make sure that every decision is made. Captain and I are always concurrently talking about our plans. It's going to give a person on the ground who has access to more resources than just the pilot has in the cockpit to assist during flight. I can make a phone call and get in touch with anybody at the airline that needs the help. I can call maintenance. I can call fleet captains. I can call literally anybody to help these, airplane, these guys out if there's an issue. And then it ensures that someone's always watching the flight and knows where it is if something goes wrong. Uh, for instance, Malaysian 370, they didn't have dispatchers over there. Here that would be very much less likely to happen because there's someone that always has eyes on that flight and knows where it should be at all times. So, uh, so you had a question? Yeah. So on your conversion to Key West Miami, yeah. so if your airline, say, for example, they've got a flight, they've got a flight going out from Orlando to Key West It's something that can be considered given the situation. There are certain scenarios where we have to land now. But if we have time and we can come up with a better plan, that's something we will do. Yeah. All right. It's a great job. I'm going to talk a little bit longer um, once we're done with this dispatching stuff about some things United has going on that's very exciting. Um, but yeah, every day is different. You never know what you're going to get. It's satisfying um, to move an airplane from somewhere on the other side of the world back home. There's no other feeling like it. Unlike the pilots, we get to go home every night. We get to fly anywhere in the world for little to no cost on pretty much any airline. And like the pilots, but we get to go home every night, we get to fly in the flight deck. So we get to fly in the jump seat. So it's a great job. So in, in fact, that's kind of how I got here this weekend. I flew down from Dallas and the flight was, uh, flight was full, so I had, to, I had to ride the jump seat to get here. So it's, uh, it's I think, something we didn't really mention early uh, kind of up front is just like training the, the training and qualification portion for us. It's uh, in order to keep our certificate current every year, we have to spend a minimum of five hours uh, observing in the flight deck jump seat. So uh, not only is uh, do we do that to satisfy the uh, the regulatory requirement, we can also utilize that for uh, personal travel um, from time to time then as well. So, so I'm gonna take a, just a couple minutes here. Um, Talk about a couple of things United has, and we'll take questions at the end if that's all right. Um, so United, uh, we're expanding. We have a lot of pathway programs now. Um, there's retirements, there's expansion going on. We need a lot of employees uh, to keep the operation running, right? 
Uh, we have lots of experience that is here now but won't be here in the next 10 years, and we want to pass that experience on, right? So people are getting into major airlines at record paces now. Uh, absolutely insane how fast people can get to major airlines. Flight simulator servers out there that are passionate and they understand that Flight Simulator is a great tool, but there are other tools out there to be successful in the industry. Awesome candidates to go into the real world. I know so many Flight Simulators that have been uh, simmers that have been so successful within the real world uh, because of their passion towards the hobby and wanting to go further. So, uh, so the traditional career path, if you wanted to be a pilot, you were looking at thousands upon thousands of dollars, um, building hours, getting your licenses, you had to have a degree or military, you'd have to go to the regional airlines. Um, long, long pathway. Dispatchers, you had to go through our certification course, and then you went to the regional airlines, you were looking at you know, about five years to get into a major airline. Same thing with maintenance technicians, you had to get your licenses all on your own dime, and then go into the uh, regionals. Well, United is creating pathway programs. So for the pilots, we have the Aviate program. This is, uh, I'll talk about this in depth more in a second. For the maintenance technicians, we have a Calibrate program that is a internship, um, apprenticeship actually, to get you uh, your maintenance certifications. And then Dispatch, we have what's called the Navigate program, which is gonna get you that dispatch license. So Aviate launched in 2019. They also have an Aviate Academy, which is a flight school. There are many different paths. The flight school path, you don't need any hours. You don't need a private pilot certificate. You would just enroll in that program and you would start your way on the path to becoming a United pilot. Uh, the AV8 program is the program that transitions you from the private pilot up into United. So there's many pathways here. I'm not an expert on them by any means, but essentially you start at a university or a flight school, you get your ratings, you build time, and then you go to a 135 carrier or a United Express carrier or you work with as a fleet training instructor and eventually you build your way up and you become a line pilot at United. If you want better information, you can scan one of these QR codes um, and it'll put you in touch with the people who really know all about the program so they can uh, point you in the right direction. The uh, website is unitedaviate.com. That's where that uh, left QR is gonna take you. Uh, Calibrate program is a 24 to 36 month paid apprenticeship. There's three career paths. You can be a ground service equipment technician. Uh, facilities maintenance means you would you know, fix jet bridge, fix the baggage systems at the airport. Uh, and then there's the aircraft maintenance technician, you know, the airframe and power plant stuff. All three of these. That's the QR code if you wanted to learn more about the Calibrate program. Brand new, and I, I like that it's a paid apprenticeship. That's, that's really cool. And then Navigate, this one's near and dear to my heart because I helped develop it. Uh, so it's a brand new 60, uh, Part 65 dispatcher course to get you your license. Developed by Active United Instructors, included myself. Uh, I think I'm back there somewhere. That's our opening of the program. We just started in June. Provides pathways to employment as United Dispatch. Um, as part of that program, United was kind enough to provide a bunch of swag for you on the table over there. So feel free to uh, grab some of that when we're done. And then I'm happy to answer any questions about Navigate. I'm very confident I know about that program as opposed to the other ones. So um, well, thanks for bearing with me on that one. Uh, thanks for attending. And do we have any questions for either Mike or myself? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Mike here. OK. Let the guys know who those of you who are on fly simmers and those who consider a depth dispatch uh, course. If you remember the, uh, the uh, facilities, we're talking about right. the uh, one two uh, airport facility yeah. room. If uh, you can understand, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, but if you can understand what uh, runway requirements for often for the one two uh, landing rule requirement, if you can understand that. And the aircraft you fly now, if you can get the RVR minimums and the, uh, for that particular aircraft, you can understand that concept. Um, Mike and uh, Matt, I believe, if you agree, that's the hardest concept for most new beginning dispatchers to understand, because when they came to our dispatch, it, it was very difficult for them to yeah. understand. But if they would have had flight simulator and ran the scenario on their flight simulator, 
If you can understand uh, that particular rule, the landing facility requirements on the runway, um, yeah, keep going down, I believe. If you can understand that, that's one of the top difficult uh, issues with our new dispatchers. 39. Uh, they have to, we have to explain that maybe about five or six times, and then it starts to sink in. And even managers have a, a tough time trying to understand uh, this particular rule. They're too narrow. Yes, thank you. Would yes. you agree with me, Matt? I would agree, yeah. So if you understand that, or, or, you know, deep, keep digging into it because then they throw 35, 85 at you. And it well, gets that's, that's, a, that's a whole other. Yeah. yeah it gets <laughs> deeper. So if you can understand those concepts right now, it, it really is going to help your dispatching abilities. It's also going to help you understand why flight simulators are so important yeah. uh, when it comes to instrument flying. Who else had questions? Tim, in the back. So other things we really didn't get into, which is, you know, we, we could go on for hours and days about all of this. You know, we just, you know, just really deep dive into a lot of it, but, you know, international operations and ETOPS and all of that. That's kind of a whole other, a whole other, a whole other day. So. My question is actually about international. So if you are dispatching internationally and, for example, alternate requirements are different in that country than they are in the FAA, mm. either more restrictive or less restrictive, do you have to follow a more restrictive rule if you're going Canada, Mexico, if the rules are different? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The short answer don't, is yes. Yeah, don't get me started about ca Canadian alternate requirements. So, I'll talk to you about it later. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, so we operate generally under, you know, we, we, have, we have operation specifications. You know, it's kind of you know, other rules and regulations we have to, uh, have to follow. Uh, as well, and that, that that outlines and specifies, you know, kind of the uh, the, the restrictions that we have to uh, have to comply with. You know, generally speaking, you know, it's you know kind of when in Rome, you know, it's uh, so if we if we are operating with you know into and out of a you know, particular country, we generally have to follow the rules and procedures of that country where we operate. So, so question, another question in the back there. Yes, so we, um, we have what's called theater qualifications, and part of those theater qualifications would include airports like that. So like our domestic theater, you have to be trained on the mountain airports like Eagle and all that, so that's part of our training. Same thing, if you got South America qualification, you'd have a module on you know, the old Quito airport, all that kind of stuff, yeah. So and we'd also do that, it, it's a continuing, it's not just like an initial sign off and then you never talk it about again, you know, so you know, you know, we, uh, so, um, at American Airlines, the dispatchers, we go through the domestic dispatchers, we do uh, three domestic recurrent uh, training classes every year, it's one day, eight hour uh, class. Uh, our international division is split into three divisions, we have a European division, we have a, a Pacific division, and we have a, a Latin Caribbean. Uh, division. So uh, if you hold uh, each one of those qualifications comes with an additional day of a recurrent that is division specific for that where we talk about those types of things. You know, you know terrain, volcanic activity. So it's, a, it's an ongoing continual training process. Question up front here. Okay, yeah, so if, we're, if we are carrying passengers, the answer is no. Uh, it's just not an area, an area of the aircraft. Uh, we are able to generate ferry permits where we can ferry an aircraft to a, a maintenance station, but you know, we're not carrying any passengers. That's going to be you know, crew only, uh, operating under special restrictions that we can comply with then. Yeah. Well, a question from uh, Thomas and on Discord. He says, will positions be open for international candidates? Probably referring back to your program. Uh, that's mainly HR type stuff. I would uh, reach out via one of those links um, to ask about that. Uh, you know, I can't speak on whether or not they are going to do that, so I would send an email off to those people to find out for sure. Is the facilities Thank you. The yeah. Is the facilities uh, for the dispatch are multi locations, or it's a one headquarters like in American Public, one. Dallas, and uh, 
So all the dispatches for any flight is all in Dallas. Yeah. So it's uh, we kind of think about it as like like mission control, you know. So we every, everything happens in one in one building, one location. So all you know, domestic and international. So any anywhere where we, uh, we operate flights, all the dispatchers are located in that in that one building. Yeah, so and, uh, it's the uh, same. It's similar, you yeah. have one location that all the dispatchers and operations. Right. Yeah. So ours are, ours is in the Chicago suburbs. So. All right. So, and Don, you had a question. Woo, tell you what. It's, uh, is that the one you're talking about? That's pretty good looking. Uh, they're not proprietary. I, uh, we do charge a small fee, right? We accept that. Uh, uh, yeah, we you know, Venmo, PayPal, all of that. So, but, uh, now we can uh, we can probably arrange to get you a copy of that if you like. I don't know if uh, if uh, F, uh, FSA, if it, uh, yeah. the Expo, if they they make the the the, 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 the presentation. Yeah, but the, the file, it's the PowerPoint file itself. But yeah, as Don was pointing out here, yeah. So uh, not only we do we do this real world, we also do this for fun and stimulation and. Uh, uh, Midcon, that's one of the uh, one of the virtual airlines I'm uh, I'm involved with, so uh, directly. So it's uh, we we take all of these types of planning rules and regulations and things and apply it to the to the simulation world. So it kind of uh, gives uh, gives everybody an opportunity to uh, kind of participate at that level. And so. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah.